Hello, and welcome to another episode of Together Apart. I'm Bryson Moreland. I'm the pastor of student ministries here at the Anabaptist Church. And I just want to share with you some of the things that uh, we've been going through in our Sunday school class. We just started the book of Mark, and it's very interesting. Uh, Of course, all the Bible is interesting. Let's be honest. It's all good. Um, But it's very interesting because I didn't know that the whole reason why, as I'm reading through this commentary of of Mark, um, I I didn't realize that, that John Mark, the one who wrote Mark, he he wrote it in the fact of trying to portray Jesus as a suffering servant. When you look through the very beginning of Mark, you won't see the genealogy or or even any any talking about how Jesus came to be born in Bethlehem and all that stuff. And I thought it was very interesting because as Mark is um, painting Jesus as a suffering servant that we see um, throughout his scriptures, we'll see that that no one really cares about the genealogy of a servant. Like, I just thought that was neat that it wasn't in that Bible and or, or in that in the book of, of Mark. And, um, you know, and I think what is neat is is the fact of Jesus kind of is quoted, or Jesus speaks here in, in Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 45. It kind of gives you the whole summary of Mark, in my opinion. And I, well, it's not my opinion. It's what the commentary says, and I just kind of agree with it. It says... Uh, Jesus says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Um, So that's kind of the theme of of Mark here, that that Mark's trying to portray of Jesus. And of course, we know that he's writing to the Romans, um, and which is neat because those guys are like the power-hungry kind of guys. They really don't care about Jewish customs. They just wanted to be in charge and be over them and that kind of stuff. And so Mark is writing this this is to describe that Jesus is a servant. But through the book of Mark, as we continue to study, and as I've kind of been studying ahead of where we're at, it's so neat to see that this servant Jesus is reaching so many people. But anyway, I'm not getting into that part. What I want to get into is just in the first chapter, um, when Jesus calls his first disciples in in Mark chapter 1. And... Uh, what I want to look at is, is when, as you read through the very beginning, it doesn't seem like, it just looks like Jesus is just walking around and doing things. And next thing you know, he finds these guys, uh, Peter or Simon and Andrew and James and John. And he just says, hey, y'all, get in a, come with me. Leave the boats. Come with me. Follow me. And what's neat is, is you studied other Gospels or if you've read this book called The Harmony of the Gospels by Robert Thomas and... Stanley Gundy, I think is his name, um, they give this big long description of that, that there's a lot of stuff that happens before we get to Mark chapter 1 verse 16. A lot of things that have happened. Matter of fact, we see that, um, we know that Jesus, of course, is baptized by John, but who was with John the Baptist? It was Andrew, right? A- Andrew was there and John was there. They were disciples of John the Baptist. And so in John chapter 1, we see that as Jesus is walking by, John the Baptist says something to the effect of, there goes the Lamb of God. And, and Andrew and John go over and they, they talk to Jesus and they ask him, hey, where are you staying? And Jesus says, all right, well, come with me. And, and, and he just spends all evening talking with them and that kind of stuff. And, and, and we see other things that, that happen in Jesus' life before we get to Mark chapter 1. We see that, um, of course, we know that John the Baptist proclaims the way of Jesus. I mean, that's the whole reason why John the Baptist was here. He fulfilled his purpose in preparing the way for the Lord, right? Um, After Jesus calls his his first couple um, in in John 1, we see that he goes to the Cana and turns the water into wine. Um, And then what's neat is Jesus then invites his disciples, those who are already with him, back to spend time with Jesus's family at Capernaum for a couple days and hangs out with them. And then, of course, they, they continue to to, to travel, and that's what's neat. You go look at the, all the traveling that Jesus did with these guys before he even calls them to give up everything and follow him. He spends time in, in them getting to know who he is. 
But anyway, we see that he goes into, um, he, he watches, the disciples watch Jesus cleanse the temple and, and you know, make the, the, the whip of cords or, um, and he cleanses the temple and flips over the tables. And then they remember Psalm 69, 9, where it talks about how you will have a zeal for the house of the Lord. And, and so they remember that. And then right after that in John 2, we see that um, they witness many miraculous signs. It's not really given any, doesn't say, you know, healing people or anything, but miraculous signs. So we're assuming healings. We're assuming probably some, um, I don't know if he does any more water and wine kind of stuff, but I'm just assuming he probably does some healings and that kind of stuff. And then what's neat is he even takes his, this group of disciples up uh, over to the J Judean countryside and he's baptizing people. Um, him and his disciples, they're baptizing people. And then there's that big argument with the Pharisees about, you know, trying to get John the Baptist. Well, hey, Jesus is baptizing more than you. And John's like, so? Like, that's great. And so we see that. And then we see that Jesus interacts with a Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. He's talking with them there. And, and they they come and they, they witness all of that. And then after that, we see that Jesus heals a... Uh, uh, a royal officer's son. Um, and then, of course, they're, they're hearing throughout all this, they're hearing Jesus preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so we're going through, and that's just some of the stuff that I wrote down on my little notepad here. Um, like, that's why I kept looking down, because I can't remember all that stuff. But it is neat that Jesus has spent so much time with these, with these guys and, and so many before he ever asked them, follow me. And what's neat is, is as we read, let's just go ahead and read in Mark chapter 1, verse 16, okay? It says, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a little further, they saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Who were, in the, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants to follow him. So again, if you didn't know all that stuff beforehand, you would think Jesus just walking by calling people, hey, follow me, follow me, follow me. And that's not exactly how it went. But what is neat is that Jesus is, refer, is referred to as a rabbi. And what's really neat, in those times, a rabbi never asked someone to follow him. Matter of fact, everyone everyone wanted to follow the rabbi. So they were always asking, Rabbi, can I follow you? Rabbi, Rabbi. They were always seeking the rabbi. And here Jesus as the rabbi is, is asking these fishermen, these nobodies, these failures of school. I mean, they become guys of trade because they couldn't continue in the, the Pharisee teaching and training. So Jesus calls them and says, hey, follow me. And what's neat, and a lot of times we get overlooked, is, is how much time was spent with Jesus and Jesus spent with them. You know, it, from what I've gathered and, and just reading and, and looking through the harmony of the Gospels and what I've researched and talked about, seemed to be like 18 to 21 months, maybe, of Jesus had been traveling and doing these things. Like It wasn't just like, hey, spur the moment that kind of thing. It seemed like he had spent about 18 months to 20 months, 18 to 21 months with these, these, these disciples before he ever asked them, hey, follow me, give up everything and follow me. And so what's neat is in our Sunday school class, I asked the middle school students, okay, all I had was middle school students. And um, I asked them how long they had been in church. And we'll just say around 12, because everyone was around 12 to 14. And they're like, dude, we've been in church our entire lives. Okay, so so we just went with 12 years. Okay, and I said, okay, out of those 12 years, how many years would you say that you can remember learning about Jesus? Like, you know, when you're one and two and you're in the nursery and they're playing Jesus songs, do, do you remember them? Do you know them? Maybe not. But I, I guarantee if you were in church, they were doing that kind of stuff. And, and here at VBC, I know the ladies in there are doing Bible stuff with them, even at nursery age. They're, they're singing to them. They're Playing us, I know it is okay, but I just asked them how much do you think you've actually been like, like actually been learning in depth stories about Jesus? And we just said probably about six or seven years. 
I said, okay, all right, that's fine. That's what it pretty much came to be. About six or seven years. So about half their life, they can kind of remember, okay, we were intentional or maybe they just went back that far. So, and then I asked them, how many miracles do you think you've seen in your 12 years or uh, of life? And, and how many? And they're like, well, quite a few. And, you know, it was kind of on the spot. I didn't want to ask them to bring up specifics. But if I were to ask you the same questions, how long had you been um, a believer? How long have you been in church? How long have you been studying the word? I would assume for a lot of people, it's, it's longer than these four disciples have in Mark 1. Um, 18 to 20 months, right? Now they've probably been studying around with John and hearing the Pharisees and or the Pharisees, the 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 um, Pharisees teaching, but also the the Old Testament teaching and that kind of stuff. So they had a knew that he was coming, but they spent time with Jesus. Then Jesus called them out. And what's neat is, like I said, some only there was only a few miracles that Jesus had done before he called his four disciples. He, he turned water into wine. Um, he I mean, he, he did uh, miraculous signs in John chapter 2. We don't really know exactly what kind they were. He, um, he then healed a, a royal official's son. That's pretty much about all the actual miracles we saw that, that we can gather from the scriptures. I've only seen a few. But they had a deep understanding of who Christ was. And he was worth, because of their knowledge of who he was and that he was the true Messiah, they didn't need more. And so the question I left my, our students with on, on Sunday was, how much do we really know about Christ? And is it enough for us to say, yes, God, I'm going to follow you. Now, we know Peter and Andrew and, and John um, and James, they left the boats. They, they, they weren't fishermen anymore. Now, occasionally they go back to it. But they were like, look, I'm fully sold out on you, Jesus. And they followed him. Matter of fact, we even know that Peter was married because his, just right after in, in Mark chapter 1, his wife, uh, his mom, so his mother-in-law was sick and Jesus comes and healed her. So we see that even Peter gave up his family. Now I'm not saying it, we all have to you know, leave our families, leave our jobs and that kind of stuff. But we do, need, we do need to understand that following Christ in the way that he calls us to really follow him should cause us to sacrifice something. And really what it should make us sacrifice is sacrifice ourselves. God, listen, I'm going to stop trying to please myself. And Lord, I'm going to please you. I'm going to live. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to live my life. And I'm going to, I'm going to love my family to give you glory, to give you praise. Father, I'm going to follow you. Jesus, I'm going to follow you where you lead me. And that includes where you lead me in my family, where you lead me in my job, where you lead me in my own personal life. And so we see that the disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they just left everything and followed Jesus. And we know that he's called us to follow him, right? Jesus even says, if anyone wants to be a follower of me, he must pick up his cross and follow me, right? Um, that's what he says. He says, we got to pick it up. And when he says pick it up, it's a daily thing, not just, okay, well, I accepted Christ at camp when I was 15, I'm 40 now, so okay, yeah, that's good. Um, I'm good for the next 40 years because of that 15, uh, 15 year old decision, or I was 15 years old when I made that decision. That's not. It's not exactly how it works. It's a daily thing. Every day we should be looking to follow Christ, where he's going, what he's doing, and where he's leading us. And Jesus wants to take us deeper and deeper. As we know, he calls the four here, and later on he, he picks 12 from 144. Like we see that and that kind of stuff. And the things that they saw, the things that they saw and got to be a part of. I mean, if Peter wouldn't have decided to follow Christ, he would not never walked on water. Like John never would have been um, given the revelation of revelations. So many other things that they could have missed out on if they weren't following Christ. And the question is, what are we missing out because we're not selling out and living for Christ and following him? Man, God only does miraculous things. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, comes from God. And so we know that as we follow him, yeah, we might have hard times. I mean, the disciples did not have an easy life. No, by no means. But it was a rewarding life because they were sold out and following Christ. And so that is what I want to leave you with today is Mark chapter 1 verse 16 through 20 is just that these four guys sold out. They gave up everything for Christ. And it wasn't until they had spent time with Christ. So the real question is how much time are you spending 
to get to know who Jesus really is because he has called you. He has said, hey, follow me. And the question is, do you know enough about him to say, Jesus, you're literally all I need because that's what these four guys did. Thank you, and I hope this, this message speaks to you. It spoke to me, and I'm thinking, man, I can always, I can always sell out more to Christ. And so I hope, I hope this word, uh, the, the word of Mark, and just speaks to you and um, takes hold of you. Thanks. Thank you.